Okay, so now that we learned the basics for drawing, now it's time to look at uh, more advanced options and commands in this environment. And now we're going to look at auxiliary views. One of the views that is quite useful in addition to the three standard views and isometric is called the section view. And this is the view using which you can see the hidden features inside the part. The ones that typically appear as hidden lines, dash lines on the three standard views. So here we assume that we are cutting the part with an imaginary plane at a specific location and then whatever portion of the material that is cut and it is on the top of or coincident with the cutting plane when we draw that we're going to use this inclined lines called hatching lines so we hatch it and whatever of the material that is behind the cutting plane we show it using visible lines okay so for example let's look at this simpler example is let's say here we have a cube and there is a cylindrical hole in it and now we're going to cut it in half using a vertical plane that is passing through the middle of the object so <clears throat> if you now see it here from basically this point to this point and from this point to this point the cutting plane coincides with the component so there is material on the cutting plane therefore if you just bring them right here right down here then you're going to see that this portion of the material which corresponds to this line here is what we hatch and then also this portion here which corresponds to this section of the material on the cutting plane we would hatch then this cylindrical hole here the surface the semi-cylinder which is going to be behind the cutting plane we're going to show it as of course what we know when we look at the cylinder we're going to see from the side we're going to see a rectangle so this rectangle with visible lines corresponds to what corresponds to this uh, semi-cylindrical surface while if we had to show the front view of this part without the section plane we would see something similar to this without the hatching lines and with these two vertical lines being dash lines right so this hidden feature the cylindrical hole is now what visible and the rest of the material that is cut is hatched so it converts invisibles into what into visible so this is an auxiliary view as i said but it is really helpful in showing details now one of the things that you should always do to avoid confusion is if there are features behind the cutting plane that you still cannot see still hidden then you're not going to show their hidden lines so for example let me tell you what i mean here so let's say if i have another small cylindrical hole like this okay behind the cutting plane like that okay and let me make this uh with no color fill like that so if i want to and uh, let me maybe um, bring this guy a little bit uh, bring it a little bit to this side here so uh, if I have another cylindrical hole like that and when I cut this material with this vertical plane this guy is behind the cut plane so if I want to show that hole here on this uh, section view what I need to use is I need to use basically a couple of vertical edges right like this so i need to use a couple of vertical edges let me make them a little thicker for you so that you can see them and i use a different color maybe red and then i use dashed 
for you like this and then another one with some offset like that okay so I have to show that uh, hole with these two invisible dash lines but to avoid confusion we never show hidden lines in a section view so although that guy might be there but when I do the section view I'm not gonna show it here okay so I just show it as I'm showing right now I neglect those uh, hidden features because what I really care is this feature that I'm cutting if I was really interested in this hole here I would move my cutting plane from the middle to what to the middle of this hole here so when you're cutting something it means you're interested in that feature and seeing that feature as visible not other features so avoid using um, dash lines on a section view. A couple of other important things about a section view is if uh, uh, when, when you're doing it by hand, which we are not really doing in this course, but if you ever have to do something, some uh, drawing by hand on a piece of paper, you have to make sure that the hatching lines should never be parallel to the uh, boundary edges of the object nor perpen perpendicular to it they should be at angle like this now for our case the software knows it and the software will take care of it for us so we don't need to uh, worry the other thing is each material has its own hatching style what do I mean by that it means for example if I cut steel here or if I cut aluminum here then the distance between these hatching lines and the angle of these hatching lines will be different so each material has the distance and the angle of the hatching lines different than the other material and uh, even sometimes the color is different too so uh, again in this course since we are using software and um, We are not going to be worried about uh, SOLIDWORKS. You still see some Katia in my lecture. I don't know where it come from, but <laughs> still there. Mm, a couple of more things is if there is assembly. Again, software here will take care of it for us, but I want you to know that when we have assembly, uh, the parts that are touching each other, the adjacent parts, the angles for the hatching lines of them if you see the angles are opposite like one of them is positive slope the other one is negative slope okay so each two parts that are touching each other adjacent one of them has positive angle for hatching the other one negative so that you can distinguish that these are two different parts so this is if you ever have to cut an assembly and all of the components in it one other thing that you need to know is about ribs and webs okay thin parts that are connecting two big sections together like for example this part here or if you know i beams right so let me show you if you know i beams which i guess everybody knows but uh, if you look at an i beam like this this top part and this bottom part are called what? Of course, yes, they are called flanges. And this middle part, this thin part that is connecting the two flanges together, this section here is called the web, okay? So if you have webs or if you have ribs, like in this problem here, this guy here, this middle uh, plate is called a rib or a web here you might call it the web too these when you cut them you're not going to hatch them although you are really cutting the material and there is material coincident with the cutting plane you are not going to hatch it and the reason is it might create the impression that well if i hatch this whole thing it might create the impression that this is actually not just a thin rib, it's actually a thick extrude, okay? 
because if these two parts were connected using a thick extrude instead of just a thin rib or web, if you cut it, you're gonna see this picture, you're gonna see this section in uh, part B, right? And if you also, again, cut it here, so we are looking at section AA in pictures A and B, we are looking again. So this top section is for section BB. These uh, two pictures here are for section AA. So if we cut this thin rib, we're going to show it with this picture. And we are not going to hatch the rib area, although we cut it really with this plane. And again, the reason is to avoid the confusion that, hey, we are cutting a big, thick extrude. We are just cutting a thin object. And I mentioned that for you here too. Now, uh, how do we create uh, section views in SOLIDWORKS? By the way, one of the things that really matters is the direction of section plane. So although we cut this object in half by this section, the view that we get depends on whether we are looking at the right, for example, in this picture, the right side of the section or we are looking at what? The left section. And that direction does matter in the appearance of the section, right? For example, here, you see the arrows are to the right. So if I look at section AA, all I would see is what? Basically, all exists is this uh, cylindrical hole, which you can see here. But if I look on the left side, not only I see that cylindrical hole, there is another hole here too, right? Although we are not going to show invisible lines for it, but it exists. So not always the two sides of a section are symmetrical, they are not identical. So we need to determine the direction of a section to get the appropriate section view, okay? And let me show you how we do that. So if we go back to this uh, chamfered machine hole part, that uh, thread part that uh, I was working on um, in previous lectures. So we are going to cut this object and create a section view. By the way, remember I told you that the um, whole feature in SOLIDWORKS, when you create drafting out of it or drawing, it shows this uh, symbol, which is called, uh, if you double click on it, it's called the dowel pin symbol. So this dowel pin symbol is something that SOLIDWORKS asks for you, but uh, if you don't like it, which I personally don't, you just click one time on it and then use delete from the keyboard and there we go, okay? So I don't think it's a good idea to add that dowel pin symbol here because it might add the impression that that could be like uh, the centroid of the object. So I just recommend you delete it. So now in order to create a section view, this is what we do. So we go under view layout and then we click on the section view. And then we go to the view we want to cut. So let's say here, I want to cut this uh, top view, okay? So I can make a vertical cut like this, or I can come here on the left side, the cutting line, and instead of vertical, I can make it what? Horizontal, or I can make it at angle, or I can even use a combination. So for the moment being, let's use vertical. So we use vertical and put it wherever I want. Let's say I put it through the center of this hole. Okay, and now you see that I can create the left view of this section if I move my mouse to the left side or right. Can I move it to the right? So right now, it seems like this direction does not change, right? I'm only looking at the left side. But if you come here, you can see it says what? Fill it direction. So if you do that, now I'm looking at what? The right side, okay? So they seems to be quite the same. And yes, they are because it is not showing this uh, hole here. But let me show you. If I make it back to the left side, like this, okay? So the thing that I asked you not to do was not to put the uh, hidden lines on a section view. 
but if I click on this section view and activate visibility of section uh, hidden lines I'm sorry there we go yeah so now you clearly can see that because this hole is behind the section plane if I want to show it it's gonna be hidden lines but this is not a good practice so I ask you not to do that but if I click on this section view okay so if I click on this section view and uh, let's see if I can fill up the direction again so if I click on these arrows let's see if I can change the direction of the arrows so these are the arrows drawing view let's see if I can do it from here so this is the cutting section line and you see when I double click on it it's gonna reverse it for me so if I double click on it and make it to the right and bring this guy here to the right and rebuild it right you see what do I have that hole is gone because now I'm looking to the right side but this hidden edge is added and what is this for yes that is for the bottom of this inclined surface so you clearly see that the right view of the section is different than what the left view of the section right and you see that when I grab this view and bring it from one side to the other if I want the change in the direction of arrow to be effective I have to rebuild it okay but again as I said do not use uh, uh, hidden lines okay on a section view so go ahead and make sure that no hidden line is shown okay so this is for the sake of showing a section view the other thing I wanted to ask you is uh, I wanted to uh, tell you not to ask you is uh, can I change the hatching of this section yes but I absolutely do not recommend if you double click on these hatching lines it brings this command for you area hatch fill and if you uncheck this which says material cross hatch this is for the material that we use for this part but if I want to I can uncheck it and then what I can change the angle of these lines and I can change what the offset between them or the number of them per one inch okay so I can change it if I want to but again I absolutely do not recommend you doing that okay I absolutely always recommend just leaving it for the material crosshatch because uh, the hatching that you make could not necessarily be what is supposed to be for that material so do not mess up with the hatching lines as much as you can okay and I mentioned that here now one other interesting thing about section views is a broken out section so broken out section is like a partial section view and uh, so instead of cutting the whole part in half you just cut a portion of it to show an interesting feature so I'll show you that as well by the way uh, let me mention why is this section view is a good thing so let me get rid of this for a moment and show the hidden lines on these guys good so remember when we wanted to talk about what when we wanted to talk about the depth of this hole here for example what did we do we said when we want to provide the depth of this so one way was we came here and we could measure this it was 1.57 so then we went on this diameter and when we had this diameter we added a depth to it so we said what this is 1.57 and then we added depth so we said try to avoid showing the depth on what on the invisible lines try to avoid that so one way to avoid it was to use this depth symbol and showing it on the diameter but another way to do it is what yes cutting this guy so I can go back and create a section view horizontal on this uh, top view which passes through the center of that hole
Okay, and then what? Bringing it down or up like this. And look, now this hidden feature is now shown as what? Yes, visible features. So now if I want to, I can go ahead and add that depth here on visible lines, right? So I come here and I add that depth here. This is good, this is fine. Okay, so that's the advantage of section view, avoiding hidden features and putting dimensions on hidden features in addition to clarifying them, right? So that's one of the big things about uh, section view. Now, as I said, we can do a partial section view using the method called broken out section. So the broken out section, if we go back under view layout, it's here, it's broken out section. So let's say I want to apply a broken out section. So first says, okay, what do you want? You want to apply to what? Let's say I want to apply to um, the, the top view from this edge. Oh, I guess the wrong command was working. So, or no, actually, I guess it was right. It was the SP line that you need to use to cut. So again, I click on this, and what you need to do is first to draw with an SP line around the area you want to cut. So let's say I come here and I say, only cut for me this area. I'm not interested in the whole object. Cut for me in that. And then it says, okay, fine. Do you want a reference edge? If you don't, then it uses the plane that you clicked on as your reference plane and then it will cut that part in a depth of this much from that plane. So right now what it does, this is the plane that you draw your SP line on, which is this edge basically. And now it is gonna come back about 0.1 of an inch. So it is gonna cut it with the horizontal plane that is 0.1 of an inch behind the front plane. It will cut it with that and it will show below that cut, behind that cut. So um, let me make this a little bigger. By the way, you can always use preview to see, right? So if you look here, what is it that I'm looking? Yes, if you look here, this uh, section is still not there, right? Because it's just 0.7 behind, so it's somewhere like here. So what it is really cutting is just solid material. And that's what you see, it's all hatched. But if I go exactly what? 1.57 back, then it's like I'm cutting it with the plane that is passing through the center. So if you now click, okay, let's see. Uh, is, oh, no, that's not 1.57. That is the depth of this uh, thing here. So let's measure it. Yeah, I forgot to measure that. So it's this distance here. It's 1.93. That's how much I should go back. So if I uh, go to this section view. Okay, so is it this guy? I assume so, but um, now it is added to the um, it is added on the top of the view. So one of the things about the broken out section is it's not going to add a separate view from the original one. It's going to add the hatching and the section on the top of the original view. So here I do it again and I draw the SP line around this feature I'm interested in. And then here I provide 1.93 and look at the preview and there we go. You see now it is cutting exactly here through the center. And so it shows everywhere hatched, but that feature that I'm interested in it is showing it with visible lines, right? So you clearly see that is the drilled hole and this is the tapered thread. So this is called broken out section. 
Okay, so now uh, let's look at the auxiliary view. I guess I mentioned it, but I mentioned it again. So if you have a plane type 2 or oblique plane, okay, or I'm sorry, normal plane, normal plane, oblique is plane type 3, normal plane. What is a normal plane? A normal plane like this guy here is a plane that is perpendicular to one of the three major views, I mean front, top, and right, and not parallel to the other two planes, like this, okay, plane type 2. Now, plane type 2, when you look at it in the three standard views, in one view, it shows itself as an inclined edge, and the, in the two other views, it shows itself as a plane, but smaller size, right? Let's go back here. So this plane here, this guy, this is that uh, normal plane. So you can see the size here for that plane and another size here for that plane. But none of these two guys are the actual size of... Let me add the isometric. Let me add the isometric. So none of them is this guy here. Right? None of them is this plane here, this guy. This one and this one are smaller than that, and here is just an edge. So you might say, well, if I really want the actual size of this plane shown in a view, what view should it be? And the answer is, well, it has to be an auxiliary view. It could not be any of the major views. Okay, It's not going to happen in any of the three major views. So what you need is... You need to project this plane on a, uh, another plane that is parallel to it. You have to project it on a plane that is parallel to it in a normal way. And then on that plane, which is called an auxiliary plane, it's going to show its actual size. Okay, So this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a projection plane parallel to our normal plane and then project the a face of interest on it to see its actual size and you can see that command for it here is called auxiliary view so I click on the auxiliary view and then it says click that edge the inclined edge that represents your surface of interest and clearly that's this edge here right so I click on this edge and immediately after I click on that edge the auxiliary view is showing itself so here I bring it to this side and I OK that. And there we go. If you now look and I can turn this. Uh, by the way, an auxiliary view also is not a good idea to show hidden features. So let me get rid of the hidden features. So this is the auxiliary view of this part. If you look at it in a direction parallel to this plane. Okay, you're going to see this one, right? Now you might wonder why is it that you only see two planes, not three. So if I move this to this side, let's do a rebuild. Okay, so why is it that I see two planes? Anybody has any idea? I know you cannot get back to me. This is online class, but I'm interested. Look at here. When I click flip direction, look how the view changes. So you go from just two simple planes to what? To three planes and the two holes. Yes, because it depends on when you're looking at that plane parallel to the surface, in which direction are you looking? Are you looking outward of this plane or inward? Okay, so this is inward view. So you're looking from basically, let me see if I can uh, draw something for you you're looking in this direction. Okay, so if you look in that direction, you see three planes. Of course, you see this plane, this plane, and this plane here, and then you see the holes. And now this here, this area here, if I can hatch it, let's see if I can do something to the surface. Uh, not necessarily, but if I can just maybe draw some lines for you here. So this surface that I'm showing with zigzags, 
this guy. So this surface is the actual size of my interested surface, okay? So that's the actual size. And when you reverse the direction, so instead of looking in that direction, you are now, you might be looking in this direction. So let me show you. If you now say, well, I would like to see it in this direction. So it's still normal to this guy, but in this direction, right? Then it's like, as I said, in this guy flipping the direction. So it's like you're looking from the back side. And so all you would be seeing is this back plane here, if you can see it, and this other back plane here. That's all you can see. So this is auxiliary view. What's next is detail view, and then break view and crop view. So detail view is like a magnifier. You zoom into a specific area of a part, and you make it much bigger to show more details about it, okay? So let's say here, for example, uh, for some reason I'm interested in uh, some feature over this uh, inclined surface, okay? So I'm only interested in that portion. It has more details. Of course, in this case it doesn't, but let's say I want to magnify that area and put more info in it. So what you need to do is you click on the detail view and then it allows you to draw a circle around the area of interest. Okay, and then you can bring it out and you can make a detail view like this. Okay, so clearly see this is the same area but magnified and you can always what? You can always change the scale, right? So this is a custom scale can make it one to two, you can make it two to one, make it much bigger and so on and so forth, right? So this is really good when you have something that has a ton of information and you cannot squeeze all of that in a small view with everything else. And you might wonder, like what? Well, like for example, the profile of a gear tooth, right? You have done that practice in class when you want to create the profile of a gear to it there are too many dimensions and parameters that you have to show on the involute profile of the gear tooth and you cannot show all of them on the front view of the gear with everything else so you might just zoom on one of the teeth and then bring it out magnify it and then show everything else that you need to show okay so this is an extra magnified view to show more details, basically. Now, uh, the last thing is cropped view or break view. And this is for the objects that are long and they have repetitive features that you don't want to show because let's say here, if I just show one or two of these holes, one from the top, one from the bottom, and then do a short break like this with zigzag lines, then I'm telling the viewer that, hey, this whole thing is similar to this, it's just repeating features, and I don't need to show this huge long thing, right? Let's say you want to create a drafting out of a train or something really tall or deep in depth, so you're not going to show the whole thing on a piece of paper compared to its cross-section, which is much, much smaller. So what you do is you cut that long view using the break view or crop view, and I always recommend break view over crop view, and I'll tell you why. And with the zigzag, you show that, hey, I actually cut this guy and made it shorter to fit on the page. So let me show you that here. So uh, if I go to sheet two, and bring in the standard views of this uh, multiple feature thing here. So this is what I need, and let's make this a little bigger. So uh, let's use one to two maybe. Okay, so now you clearly see 
Maybe I do the same thing for this guy too. Okay, so you see clearly here that, well, if I want to squeeze everything on this paper large enough, I cannot do it with these two line views. Especially like this one is completely out of the uh, paper. So what I can do is I would break this into a shorter view and just show the features that might be of interest. So what I can do is I need to click on what? Break view. And then here it says select drawing view to break. Okay, so if I choose this and then you can choose the location of the two breaks. Either you want to do the breaks vertically or horizontally. In this case, I want to do them horizontally. So let's say I want to just uh, keep the top part of this zigzag and then the bottom of this zigzag. Okay, so one here maybe and one here. There we go. Okay, so now this is a much shorter version of the big guy and I can probably show everything that I needed. If I needed to show an offset also on this, maybe I use on one side two of the holes and on one side one of the holes, something like this probably. So I click here and then uh, uh, so I click on this and go horizontal and maybe put one here and then one here. Okay, that definitely would do the job for me. Right, and now I can clearly bring this up. And then if I want to, I can apply a similar thing to the right view as well, right? So the right view you see clearly is repeating itself. So again, I can do a break view and then I click on this guy and do vertical sections, maybe one here and one here. And there we go. Okay, so not always I need to show a lot of features repeating. So this was the break view, but you can also crop if you want. You can use the crop view as well. The thing with crop view is it's not gonna show the break really, and it might give you the impression that this is the actual view, okay? So it could be a little misleading or confusing. So I'll show you how you can crop a view, but again, I don't think that's something standard that you would see in drafting, so I always recommend break view over that. So for example here, let's say I want to cut, um, again, this top view, but this time with the crop. So the thing with crop is you need an existing view and you need a sketch to make it happen. So before I do anything, I would sketch the area that I want to crop from the rest of it, maybe something like this. Okay, and then with this sketch active, I click on crop view. There we go. Okay, so you clearly see it will keep the area inside that enclosed sketch and throw everything else away. But again, that will give you the impression that this is the depth of the object and then that one will contradict this one. So I, again, do not recommend this tool, although it exists in SOLIDWORKS. Okay, so this is the next lecture that we had. And finally, I will add later for you a lecture on uh, GDNT and tolerances and we'll go through the rest of this lecture and we'll talk about tolerances and surface finish and uh, if time allows maybe very briefly about welding okay so we'll talk about that later part of the drawing about tolerances in GDNT and GDNT stands for geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. So the first question you might have is what is the tolerance? So tolerance is technically defined as the amount of deviation from the actual or nominal size, desired size that the manufacturer can make the part with 
and still be useful and usable okay so you might say well <clears throat> if you have a simple part like maybe a spoon and uh, uh, the size of the spoon is let's say uh, eight inches but the manufacturer make it 8.01 or 8.05 what does it change probably nothing but if the parts are assembled together and fit together so they have to all work together then imperfection has a tolerance has a limit okay so if you have two parts let's say you have a, a salt shaker right the body of the salt shaker and the top the lid of the salt shaker the diameter of them has to be in a tolerance range right if one is much bigger or much smaller than the other one they cannot fit together so tolerance is extremely important when it comes to putting the parts together and assembly right so it's the amount that the manufacturer can deviate from the size that you gave them before uh, the part is basically useless and you have to redo it. Now, uh, you might wonder what is this tolerance depends on? What does this tolerance depends on? And how do we show it to the manufacturer and so on and so forth? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, first, let's see uh, the importance of it. So we learned that, well, of course, if you do not make the parts to the tolerance, you cannot use it. But you might say, well, uh, can I just make the tolerance tighter to just be sure, right? Let's allow very small margin to the manufacturer for imperfection. So if the nominal size is 8 inches, I'm going to tell him that, hey, you cannot make this part uh, with a thousandth of an inch plus or minus off the actual the nominal size. Although I can really tolerate as much as 0.05 maybe, but I tell him that no, 0 0.001 inch is all you can be off. Well, what's the effect? The effect is tighter tolerances or smaller tolerances means what? Means they have to use more accurate machines and they have to use more time to get to that tolerance. So to manufacturer, tolerance means a lot. Although to us, we say, well, the closer to the number I want, the better. But to them, it means a lot of time and money. And then, of course, it means to your company who designed it. So do not go too tight on tolerance if you can. But, of course, on the other side, you don't want to make it too loose so that it's not useful. Okay, so there is a trade-off here between the time and the usefulness of the part, finally. For example, at ERAU machine shop, right? When you send something to Patrick or Jeff or Jared to make it for you, this is the table they have. So although to uh, engineers or maybe mathematicians, the number of zeros after decimal point does not really mean anything, right? So one... 0. 0.000 is the same as simply one without any decimals and is the same as 1.0 so with one decimal so to to us that's all means one but not to the uh, machinist so if you send something without any decimals to them it means they can be off by point plus or minus 0. 0.025 if you use one decimal, it means they can only go plus minus 0.15. Two decimals means 0.01. Three decimals means 0.005. And four decimals means 0.0002. So make sure if your part does not need to be super accurate, like it's a uh, bearing cages or something that needs to be really smooth and accurate, then do not put a bunch of zeros after the decimal point because it means they have to hit very, very tight tolerance and it means a lot of time and money. 
typically they told me that what they try to achieve is this guy here so 0.05 0 .005 plus or minus but if you have more uh, room you might just provide them with uh, fewer decimal points for angles all they can hit is plus or minus one degrees okay so uh, do not ask them that the angle I want is 85.69. They cannot go below one angle based on the machines we have currently at the machine shop. Yes, you might get some other manufacturer to go less than one degree, but it's going to be a significant cost. Okay, now, before we get uh, into more depth of tolerances, I want you to know if uh, what, what I'm covering here is just like an intro to tolerances and GDNT. I don't have the room in this course to cover a lot more for GDNT. So what I'm tr uh, trying is like the surface of it. But if you want to learn more, you can take courses or standards or textbook published by American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME or purchase a textbook or something and read more, okay? Now, before I get to how you determine how much of tolerance you need, let's first see how we show the tolerance in SOLIDWORKS drawing or in any other CAD software's drawing. So one of the simple ways is a general tolerance note. This is useful when all of the dimensions you have are basically sharing the same tolerance, okay? This is very useful. So for example, if you remember this title block that you have at the bottom right corner of your uh, drawing page, so you can come and under notes, either inside or outside the table, you can provide a note like this. You say, unless otherwise specified, all dimensions are in inches and tolerances are what? For angle, plus minus 2 degrees, and for decimals, it's what? 0 0.03 or 0 0.05 or whatever it is. Okay, so it means, unless I say something else, all of the dimensions share the same tolerance. And this is really useful because otherwise you have to show that plus minus 0 0.03 on all of the dimensions and that plus minus 2 degrees are all of the angular measurements, okay? And that means your drawing will be a lot more crowded. So uh, I always ask my students to provide this in their title block, okay? And this is very useful. So let me show you how to do that here. Although you probably know it, how to modify the title block. But I'll uh, redo it just as a practice and then we come back. So if we go back to SOLIDWORKS here, this is our frame and title block. And then I want to come and add that writing here. So I right click on sheet format, go to edit sheet format and then get in here. And you see here I have finish, I have title, I have everything. So if I don't want finish, I can change this to note, okay? Or actually in SOLIDWORKS, there is one specifically allocated to that, so I don't need to modify this. So you see here, it says, unless otherwise specified, dimensions are all in millimeters or inches, surface finishes are this, tolerances is, so if you double click here, you say, well, linear is plus minus 0.05, Okay, if you want, you can probably add plus and minus two. And then uh, the angle is also plus and minus one degrees. Okay, and then turn this back to sheet view. And that's the general note that you need. I'll, we'll talk about surface finish and others later, but uh, this is very important to the machinist. So. Please get into the habit of adding that into your drawing from this point on. Now, uh, we learn about that. Now, if your drawing has several pages or documents, then you might, in one of the pages, refer to a previous one and say, hey, the tolerance in this document or in this drawing is the same as 
the other document or that's drawing number five or six or so on. So I can refer to mm, the ones that uh, I want to talk more about is the limits version and the uh, by uh, we call it the uh, plus minus form. So plus minus form and limit form are like what? So limit form is like this. So you actually do not show the nominal size that you really want. Instead, you show what? The minimum and the maximum size for that dimension that are acceptable. So you show the lower and the upper limits of that dimension. In the plus and minus form, you show the nominal dimension, this 1.25, but also using plus or minus, you show that how far away from that nominal you can go. So here you can go to what? 1.2526 basically or 1.24, that's what you can go. I personally always prefer plus and minus form, not the limit form, and I recommend you always use plus and minus form. And the reason is not always the nominal dimension that you want to hit the manufacturer to hit is the average of these two limits. So it's not like necessarily sum of these two divided by two, which is 1.25, not always. If you look here in the plus and minus version, not always the plus and minus numbers are the same. So sometimes they are the same, plus 0.01, negative 0.01. But sometimes these numbers are what? not the same. So if you just add the max and min number and divide, you are not going to get the nominal size. So now this plus and minus form, it has some terminologies. So if the plus and minus range are the same number, we call it bilateral equal. If one of these plus or minus is zero, we call it unilateral. So unilateral means what? You can only be either bigger than the uh, nominal size or less than the nominal size. You can only be on one side of it. So it's called unilateral. Bilateral means you can go a little bigger or a little smaller. Now, if you exactly can go the same above or below, it's called bilateral equal. If you can go above and below, but they are not the same, then we call it what? Bilateral unequal. Okay, so just some terminologies for you to learn. Now, how do we show this in uh, SOLIDWORKS? As I said, I would really encourage you to do plus and minus. So let's do plus and minus form. And I show you how to add that to your dimensions. So if we go here and then click on annotation and add a number here like this, and now I wanna show the tolerance. So you clearly see it here on the left. Remember, we changed the precision. So this is how we change the precision, but also above that we have what? Tolerance. And for tolerance, you can use limit form, min, max form, bilateral, so many. But again, I always recommend using bilateral and then providing what? Amount of plus or minus. So maybe I can go plus 2 and minus 0 0.01, right? Like that. And that's it. Okay, so this is very, very important that we show our dimensions this way, which is much more preferred and easily readable than the rest of the formats. Now, remember when I started to talk about the uh, dimensioning in the past, in the, uh, I guess it was two or three lectures ago, I mentioned that we have two methods for providing several dimensions. One was the stack method, the other one was chain method, right? Let me show you, it was somewhere here, here. So in the stack method, we refer all of the entities to the same reference. In the chain method, each entity is referred back to what? the previous entity. And if you remember, I told you that when we do the chain method, we do not show the last part of the chain. Instead, we show what? The total length of the chain. And I said, I'll tell you later why this is what we do. And now that's the time. 
So the reason is this. When I have stack method, the tolerances do not add up, do not accumulate. What do I mean by that? So let's take a look at this picture. So let's say this is a part that I want to be made. And I say that, well, this dimension here is 19 plus minus 0.1. This is 44 plus minus 0.1. And this is 63, right? So let's say now that uh, the manufacturer creates this portion A with 19 plus 0.1, okay? So he's just making each dimension to the max of it that could be. So he makes this exactly 9.1. And also he makes this other one what? 44.1 fine now is it gonna affect the fact that he made both of these two dimensions bigger is that gonna affect the overall size 63 what do you think compared to the chain case so now let me go and show you the chain case so if you use chain dimensioning the tolerances stack up why in the stack method we say we don't uh, we don't accumulate but here we do why let's first look at this and we go back so here assume that I make part a 19.1 and make part B 25.1 and then instead of providing the 63 which is the total chain length instead of providing that I will provide what the size of the last portion which is uh, what so this is 44, so it's going to be another 19, right? So this is another 19, I assume. Yes. So now, if the machinist make this part 19.1, make this one 25.1, and make this last portion that we provided tolerance for also 19.1, what happens to the total length? Yes, it is going to be 63.3 which is what? Yes, out of the tolerance range. So you see, because I'm referring to the previous one, if I make the previous one bigger, right? And I make this one bigger and next one bigger, all of these bigger ones will be added together. All of those tolerances will be added together when I come down to what? The total length of the chain. So they stack up, they pile up, they accumulate, right? And so, although each one of these he made correctly, A, B, and C, he was not out of tolerance for A, B, or C, but for the total, now he is what? 63.3 is out of the tolerance zone. So that's why we give him the total length instead of the last one, such that if he make this one 19.1 and this one 25.1, he knows that the total of those two is what? 44.2. But for the total length, he cannot go more than 63.1. So what does he have to do for the last part? Yes, make it smaller. So the last part at most can be what? 18.9. So he has to make the last part 0.1 smaller to hold the whole thing in the tolerance range, right? So that's why we always show the total length, not all of the individuals. So we always keep one so that if he messed up all of this previous part, he still has a little bit room to correct for the total length. But in the stack method, everything is referred back to the initial one. So the fact that he make this one 19.1 is not gonna affect this 44, right? Because this 44 is also being measured with respect to what? The beginning, right? So, if he make this one 44.1 and make this one 19.1, what does it mean about B? Yes, B is exactly 25, right? He exactly hit the number. So it's not going to affect this or this one. So that's why we always leave the last part of the chain. Hopefully I could make it understood. Now, a few more terminologies. So limit, tolerance, basic dimension, and actual size. So basic or nominal dimension is the dimension that you really want the parts to be, 
That's what the designer will provide. Actual size is what the manufacturer will return. Limits are, of course, what? The max and the min that you can allow. And then the difference. So that's the mathematical definition of tolerance. The difference between the upper and lower limits is what? Yes, that's tolerance. So for example, if I come back here, what is the tolerance for this dimension of this uh, edge B? Yes, that's 25.1 minus 24.9. So the tolerance of this dimension is actually what? 0.2. The same for this, the same this, this, this. Okay, so it's max dimension minus min dimension. That is the tolerance, right? So the tolerance here for all of these dimensions is 0.2. Good. So keep that in mind. Now, we are going to, so we learned uh, some terminologies. Now, let's go back to the main question. The main question is, how do I get these numbers? Can I just arbitrarily say, well, I design a part and I think 0.01 is good or 0.001 is good. Let's put 0.001 for everything. Well, how do we know? That's not how it is really determined. It's not arbitrary. There are applications that need tighter tolerances. There are applications that needs looser tolerances. So it depends on the application of your parts, right? And the more accurate thing, it depends on the fitting type, how you fit the parts of an assembly together. Now, when you fit an assembly part, uh, the parts of an assembly together, there are three versions of fitting. We call them clearance fit, transition fit, and then interference fit. Okay, so what are these? So let's start with the interference fits, the bottom one first. So interference, or sometimes we call it press fit or pressure fit, is when the two parts that are being mated together, that are working together or fitted together, they have to basically work tightly together. Like for example, if you have a ball bearing like this here, this shaft and the bearing, they have to rotate together, right? That's the nature of a ball bearing that if you pass the shaft through the hole of a bearing, they have to rotate together. The inner ring, this guy, and the shaft, they have to rotate together. So in order for that to happen, you need a lot of friction between them. And in order for that friction to happen, then you expect that, of course, this shaft cannot be smaller than the hole. Because if the shaft is smaller than the hole, what happens? It can easily get inside the hole without any friction and so easily can also move with respect to it and so these two cannot rotate together. So in order for that to happen you need actually this shaft to be a little bigger than the hole and the question is well if the shaft is bigger than this hole how can we assemble them together and that's what the name comes from interference or press fit. So what they typically do is they apply heat to the inner ring to make it a little expand and they basically make the shaft a little colder so that it shrinks a little bit and then they use a lot of force to press them together and then when they get back to the normal temperature now there is a pressure in between them and of course a lot of friction which does not allow them to move with respect to each other we call it interference fit now, clearance is exactly the opposite of that. You do not need, you should not have any friction, let's say here, between the shaft that is rotating and the hole. The shaft should definitely be smaller than the hole so that it freely moves inside. And you might say, well, where do I see this thing? And the answer is a journal bearing. What is a journal bearing? So journal bearing is another way to make a shaft rotate inside a chamber but without any contact with it so what you have here is you have the shaft inside a lubricant and this lubricant has uh, pressure behind it so it's under pressure 
and pressure is applied typically through one of the holes inside the bearing. And then there is also a layer of um, bushing, which is an alloy, really resistance to uh, corrosion inside this. And as I said, lubricant under pressure, and this shaft is kind of suspended and floating inside this and barely touching ever the bushing. And even if it does, the bushing is really resistant against uh, corrosion, and it's not going to uh, destroy the surface of that easily. And you might say, well, where do I need such thing? And the answer is in engine, in crankshaft bearings where the crankshaft is attached to the body of the engine, okay? That's where you use these instead of these bearings. And you might wonder why. Well, the answer is if you apply a ton of force on this shaft that is rotating, that force will be applied to the bearing and to the moving elements of the bearing, which are these balls or rollers or needles or whatever element that is rotating, and that force will deform those elements, change their shape, and so you're going to see that the bearing would jam and would stop working. So these bearings are designed for a moderate load, and the load could be quite uniform versus time. You cannot change the load significantly versus time, okay? It has to be quite uniform load, and it should not be super high amount of load and super fast rotation. Otherwise, this rotating element would deform and the mechanism would jam. Now, in engine, what you have is this crankshaft is rotating super fast, several thousand RPMs, and the load that is coming on the crankshaft is coming from what? Yes, from piston and cylinders where explosions are happening. And so a huge amount of force after the explosion of mixture of fuel and air is applied to the piston in a very short amount of time. And then that force that you apply, the, the explosion applies to the piston will be uh, applied down to the crankshaft. So there is a lot of load that this crankshaft has to tolerate. It is changing significantly over time and the RPM is so high. No ball bearing can tolerate such condition, but this journal bearing can. So if you didn't know journal bearings, hopefully you learn a new component in engineering, especially for you guys that are ME. So here, as I said, shaft always has to be smaller than the hole. And there are transition cases where the shaft could be bigger or could be smaller than the hole. Now, so each one of them is a different type of tolerance, okay? And uh, first thing is you might wonder, well, how do I know my mechanism needs which type of this? I can have some intuition, some general guess, but how do I accurately know which one of these categories the uh, tolerance will, the fitting will be plus I'll show you that each one of them has subcategories. So clearance fitting is not just one category. I'll show you there are a couple transition the same, interference is the same. So out of the several classes of fitting and their subclasses, which category is my application? And then now that I know which subcategory it is, how do I find those plus and minus numbers? I'll show you in a minute. But uh, I need a couple of definitions for you here before I get to that answer. So let me show you a couple of more terminologies that we might need. And you need to learn one is called allowance. The other one is called max clearance. So allowance is the smallest gap between two objects that are assembled together. We also show it with MMC, or we call it maximum material condition. The other definition we have, we call it maximum clearance or least material condition, which is the largest allowable gap between two parts. And what do I mean by that? So let's look at this example. So let's say this is a shaft and this is a hole that we created, we machined. And the limit forms that we provided for the shaft says 
the diameter of the shaft can be anywhere between 1.247 and 1.248 and the diameter for the hole can be anywhere between 1.25 and 1.251 so what is the scenario in which the largest gap between the shaft and the hole can appear well in order to get the biggest gap you need what you need the hole to be made the biggest and you need the shaft to be made what yes the smallest that way the biggest gap exists between the shaft and the hole so that's the scenario here 1.251 for the hole and 1.247 for the gap and what is the difference between these two? 0 0.004. So 0 0.004 is what? It is the least condition material or is the biggest gap. What is the smallest gap that can exist? Yes, that's when the hole is to be made with the smallest size and the shaft is to be made with the biggest size. So in this case, it's 1.25 minus 1.248, which is 0 0.004. Two, right so MMC here is point or smallest gap is 0 0.002 largest gap or LMC is what 0 0.004 yes so let me write them for you this is plus 0 0.004 in this case and it's positive and this one here is what it is positive 0 0.002. By the way, it is always the dimension of the hole minus the dimension of the shaft. Okay. Now, when we have clearance feet or loose feet, as I said in loose fit, the hole is always bigger than the shaft always so there is always a gap whether it's the smallest or the biggest there is always a gap so what does it mean it means both of these numbers are what positive because again they are defined as the dimension of hole minus the shaft so since hole is always bigger than the shaft both of the smallest and biggest gap are what positive they exist positive means they exist Exactly opposite of that is interference. In interference, the shaft is always bigger than the hole. If you see, the min size of the shaft is bigger than the max size of the hole. So in this case, what? Never a gap exists. So if I subtract the max size of the hole minus min size of the shaft to find what? The largest gap, it's going to be what? 1.2506 minus 1.25113 so you're going to get negative 0007 and if i want to find the uh, largest uh, the smallest gap i have to subtract the smallest hole size minus the biggest shaft size so it's 1.25 minus 1.2519 so it's going to be what negative point uh 0019 right so let me write the numbers for you just for your um, learning so in this case what do I have in this case I have let me bring this down oh. in this case I have can I write here no that's quite interesting. So text box here. So we say LMC, right? And LMC again means the biggest gap is in this case one point what two five zero six minus one point two five thirteen, which is equal to negative point zero 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 seven. And then MMC, the smallest gap is 1.2500 minus 1.2513. Or, where did I get 13? I guess I'm making a mistake. Oh, that's transition fit. That's why. Okay. Let me bring that to the other side. 
Yeah, I said there, there should be something wrong here. <laughs> uh, sorry. So here. So that's 1.206 minus 13. And then here is 1.25 minus 19. So it is going to be negative 19. Okay. So you clearly see in this case that um, both of them are negative. In this case, as I mentioned, both of them are positive. And in this case, now, what about the transition case? In transition case, one is positive and the other is what? Negative. Which one is positive? Of course, the largest gap. Which one is negative? The smallest gap. Why? Because max size of the shaft is bigger than min size of the hole, but not bigger than max size of. Uh, wait. No, it is bigger than both. It could be, but the min size of the shaft is not bigger than the max size of the hole. So here, the uh, biggest gap, LMC, right? We learned that if you let me show you one more time. So LMC is what? The largest gap. MMC is the smallest gap. It could be a little misleading because you might say, well, M is maximum, so that should be maximum gap. No, actually it's reverse because it's called material condition. So MMC is the smallest gap. LMC is largest gap. And uh, again, for the case of... Uh, uh, transition fits, you see that the largest gap, LMC, is what? The biggest size of the shaft minus the smallest size of the hole, which in this case is positive. But the smallest gap is the min size of the shaft minus the max size, uh, the min size of the hole minus the max size of the shaft, which is what? negative okay so mmc is negative lmc is positive so now you can distinguish between these three types of fitting in clearance both lmc and mmc are negative uh, positive in interference both are negative in transition the smallest gap is uh, negative the largest gap is positive okay so here, I have provided numbers also for you, for your better understanding. Now, we get to the important question of, okay, where do we get these pluses and minuses? How much? Right? Yeah, it could be one bigger than the other or smaller, but how much? So, that's what I would address in the next lecture. Okay, now that we know about terminologies that we use in tolerancing, so let's talk about the question that where do we get these tolerance values? How do we determine whether we want plus or minus 0 0.01 or 0 0.005 or something like that? As I said, it depends on the type of the fitting, whether the fitting is interference, whether it is the loose fit, or whether it is the transition fit, okay? So, how do we know what type of fit we want for our application? There are dedicated textbooks, websites, and so many other resources that can tell us, although I personally advise you to go and look at the uh, uh, legitimate textbooks published by ASME, but just for an example, you can look at this website here. So here I have um, uploaded this. I, I, I've um, basically accessed this website and you can see that here is talking about ANSI standard limits and fits. And here, as I said, the running fit, the transition fit, and interference fit, each one of them typically has uh, 
two subcategories. So for example, you can see that the interference locational fits, the class of them is called LN, but the ones that are really uh, needing force, pressure, or shrink fits, we call them, are called FN, okay? So FN is the basically the uh, hardest type of fitting to for assembly, right? You, the hole is always smaller than the shaft, and uh, this is typically used when you need a lot of friction between the parts and they need to move together. On the other hand, the running or loose fit has class RC, and then if it has basically a little uh, less uh, gap, a smaller gap between the uh, two parts, then it might be class LC, LT, LN, and then the uh, transition class can be LC or LT. So, uh, for example, let's look at the very loose type of fitting, like the one we use in journal bearings, class RC, and this RC itself is also subcategorized into six groups from RC1 to RC6. So what is RC1? It says closed sliding fits. These are intended for accurate location of the parts without noticeable play. So here, although it is a loose or running fit, but the gap is not too big. But on the other hand, what? If you go to RC5 or RC6, then these are the ones that are running at higher speed with considerable, considerable bearing pressure and heavy journal pressure. So this is the kind of thing that you need for a journal bearing inside uh, engine, right? So here, as I said, you can see that um, it is talking about sub the classes that belong to each type of fit and then the subcategories, right? So uh, let's go to next page, see what they have. So here you can clearly see that when you go from RC1 to even this one continues to RC9, the gaps are getting bigger and bigger, right? So you can see them. And then the values of pluses and minuses okay for each class rc1 rc2 rc9 all of them are shown in these tables we call them tolerance tables i have shown as an example of these here in slide number 70 of our lecture so you can see classes rc1 to rc4 so i'm going to go over an example with you in a second but just wanted to show you the sources for where you get these pluses and minuses numbers right so you can see that uh these are published for any subclass of any type of those fittings. So again, you can see all of these numbers here, right? This is a very good website that you can have. And you can see here, it is talking about GDNT general dimensioning. So it talks about a bunch of topics here for you. Technical drawing dimensioning types, ANSI and ISO, tolerancing symbols, and so many other things. So if you want to know a lot more about GDNT, maybe this website can provide you some useful information. And uh, uh, also, there are standard textbooks that can tell you for what application, which class you might be using okay it's not shown over here but uh if you want i can post another website for you in which it kind of generally not super specifically mentions that hey for maybe the clutches you use this kind of fitting for brakes you use this kind of fitting for ball bearing in this application you use this kind of fitting and so on and so forth so it's kind of like general but uh when you're working in any industry, then uh, you might, not you might, you should have standard design books that provide you more info. For example, if you are in, the, in a company that uh, creates or manufactures bearings, then they have their own 
standards and they typically follow ASME if they are in the US and then they have the type of classes of fitting that they are using. But some information like that can also be found here. So for example, you see here it says uh, the, uh, let's look at here. So it says loses of the class fits used when a shaft here must move freely inside the hole or bearing positioning of the shaft is not critical. Like what? Like sliding gears, clutch discs, pivots, running and sliding fits of shafts, guiding bushings, piston of hydraulic machines, right? Of course, the piston inside the hydraulic machine should move freely. So uh, this is kind of telling you that for a general type of application, you might use class RC. And then depending on the type, you might go for low bearing pressures and specific types to go with class RC1, RC2, RC5, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this website can provide you with some good insight and good information. Now, so uh, you see, you saw these uh, subcategories. Okay, now let's look at one example together. So let's say here we have an assembly and this is the shaft and this is the part with the hole and the nominal diameter of the shaft and the hole are both one inches, right? Good. Now, we want this shaft to easily move inside the hole, okay? So we want a running or loose fit. And uh, the application, the standard for us says that class RC4 works perfectly for this application. Now, knowing that we are using, we're going to be using class RC4, what are the pluses and minuses for both the diameter of the shaft and the diameter of the hole okay that we have to provide to the manufacturer so this is class rc4 so we go and find basically the tolerance table for subclasses of rc rc1 rc2 all the way to rc4 and this table is one of them that you can also download from the website and then how do we find those numbers? So uh, let me zoom in so that you can see. So on the left side, on the first column, you see a ranges of diameters. And in what category does your nominal diameter fit? So it is one inches. So one inch is between 0.71 and 1.19. So it is in this range. And then what? From this row, you move all the way to the right until you are exactly below what? Class RC4, right? So you see class RC123. So you take this row and then move all the way to what? Right below RC4. And where you go there, that row and this column would intersect in these four cells. So these four cells are the intersection of that diameter and that RC class. And if you see here, there are two numbers for the hole and there are what? Two numbers for the shaft. So let's keep them in mind. For the hole, the numbers are plus 1.2 and negative 0. And for the shaft, they are negative 0.8 and negative 1.6. So if you go back, now if you want to provide a tolerance for the shaft, what do we say? We say, well, the shaft numbers uh, were what negative 0. 0.0008 and uh, actually they were let's go back look they were negative 0. 0.8 and negative 1.6 but you have to keep in mind that these numbers that you see in this table they are not exactly tolerance they are they should be multiplied by one thousands okay they are millis so this is 0. 0.8 times 10 to the negative three yet and that is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 3, the same for these two numbers. Of course, the tolerance of a part with a diameter of 1 inch cannot be 1.6 or 1.2, right? So whatever number you get from this table, you should multiply that by what? By a thousand. 
So that 0.8 is multiplied by 1,000, and that 16 is multiplied, 0.16 is multiplied by 1,000. And both of them were negative, so your upper limit is 0.9992, and your lower limit for the shaft size is 0.9984. Similarly, for the hole, the upper number was 12, 0.12, so you divided by 1,000, and the bottom number was 0, the negative tolerance, and of course, if you divide it by 1,000, nothing happens. So the lower size for the hole is 1, and the upper size is 1.0012. Okay, so if you want to provide the tolerance for the hole, what would you say? You say the diameter of the hole is 1 plus 0 0.0012 and 1 minus what? 0 and the number for the shaft is what? Yes, 1 minus 0 0.0008 and 1 minus 0 0.0016. Let me show you one of them over here. So let's say this is the hole, right? Let's say, for example, I want to show that whole uh, thing here. So I go to annotation, click here, provide the diameter, right? And now I go here to tolerance and choose bilateral. And if you go back, the numbers were positive 0, 0, 0012 and negative 0. So I leave the 0 as is, but for the positive, I say what? I say 0, 0. 12 and then what I provided here now one thing that you might see here is well I said positive 0 0.0012 but this one is just saying showing 0 0.001 where is that two gone well yes it's not showing it because I only I'm only using what three decimals not four so if your tolerance numbers are four decimals then when you provide the precision for this number you have to go with what you have to go with four decimals like this okay so that's how you show the tolerance for that uh, of course this is one not 0.3937 but uh, that's how you show it for that hole and then for the shaft okay so hopefully you got the basic idea of how we find these positive and negative numbers. Now, let's move on. And here, we want to talk about one other type of tolerance that we haven't talked about. So far, the tolerances that we have been talking about are called linear tolerances. They are basically the ranges that a dimension can uh, deviate from its nominal value before that part is useless okay so you say one and then plus something minus something typically and the difference between that plus and minus is what we call the tolerance so that's called linear tolerance another type of tolerance that we need to know about is called geometric tolerance okay so what is geometric tolerance let me show you and the way that we show it and we define it is quite different so here, let's say that I'm creating this T part, right? So let's say it's like a T beam, and this is the cross section. So when I'm trying to create this part, this face A, which here we call it the datum uh, feature or datum surface, this is the flat surface that I lay on the top of the machine bed. So I'm quite sure that this surface is horizontal. Now, I want this, uh, basically, uh, web of the T, I want these walls to be what? Perpendicular to A, right? I want them to be vertical. But uh, how far can I allow this wall to deviate from perfect 90 degrees, right, with respect to A? In other words, how far can I change this angle 90 degrees between that edge and this edge before this guy is not really a T anymore and I should throw it away? Well, in order to show that deviation, what they do is they're not going to show the angle, which is 90 degrees, and then pr provide a plus and a minus. So they're not going to say, hey, this angle should be 90 degrees plus or minus 0.5 degrees or so. 
That's not how they show perpendicularity. So when they want one surface to be perpendicular to a datum surface, the way they show it is they use a geometric tolerance method called uh, the perpendicularity. And the way that they show it and they define it is, uh, first, the way they show it is they uh, put a datum feature like this on the datum surface. And then on the surface that they want to have perpendicularity, they use this uh, geometric tolerance box. So this one says that this edge should be perpendicular to surface A with a tolerance zone of 0.01 inch. So what does that mean? Let me show you. So um, if you go down to here, you can see the definition of that. So that's how it's defined. For example, if I say this edge should be perpendicular to A with a tolerance of 0.12 means what? means if I make this edge not completely vertical, so it is a little bit inclined like this, then if I draw two planes, if I draw two planes that are actually perpendicular to A, and my real surface is contained between these two imaginary planes that here are shown by dash lines. Then the gap between these two imaginary planes, which completely contain my real surface, should not be more than what? 0.12. Ideally, we know that if the surface is made perfectly vertical, then these two planes would be on the top of each other and the gap would be zero. And the more the angle is deviated from 90 degrees, the wider the gap is going to be to completely contain the surface. So instead of showing the angle, I'm showing it with the gap between the two perpendicular planes to A that completely contain my surface. Okay, so that's the meaning of the tolerance zone. That's, that's gap, basically. Or let me show you another thing. For example, we say, well, uh, I want a shaft that I'm making to be circular, okay? So I don't know if you have uh, created shafts in a, a lathe machine or not, but I remember when I was doing it first time when I was in undergrad degree and I had the machine shop class, uh, it was quite horrible, to be honest. So... Uh, <laughs> If you looked at the cross section, it wasn't really like a circle. Of course, it wasn't this bad, like a triangle shape or something, but it wasn't, uh, uh, actually it wasn't just uh, the shafts that I wanted to make. I wanted to make like a semi-sphere, a hemisphere, I'm sorry. And I really messed it up, but uh, if you cannot do the job well, then the circle that you might have will not be exactly perfectly circle and you might deviate from a circle. Now, how far can I deviate from a circle before this is a completely different shape and I have to throw it away? So here I say the surface, I want it to be circular with the tolerance zone of 0.25. What does that mean? means if I draw two concentric imaginary circles that completely what? Contain my actual profile. Okay? Then the gap between them should not be more than 0.25. Of course, the bigger the gap is means the more deviated my profile is from an actual circle. And if it's perfectly circled, then the gap should be zero. Similar thing can be defined for straightness, right? So I say, I want this top surface of this object to be what? Flat, straight, with a gap of 0 0.002. What does it mean? It means if I draw two imaginary horizontal straight planes that completely contain what? The top surface, the gap between them should not be more than 0 0.002. And similarly, you can define angularity. 
So if I want to say here that this surface uh, should be at angle 30 degrees with respect to A, but if it's not exactly at angle 30 degrees with respect to A, again, I'm not going to show and say, hey, this surface can be uh, having an angle with A that is 30 degrees plus or minus 0.02. No. Instead, I say the ideal angle should be 30, but I give it a tolerance zone of 0.04. Means what? Means... If you draw two imaginary planes at angle exactly 30 with respect to A, which completely, again, contain my surface, my surface, every point on the surface is between those two imaginary planes, then that gap should not be more than 0.4, and you can define it for perpendicularity, I told you, you can define it for parallelism of two planes, and so on and so forth, okay? For concentricity of two arcs, so there are a bunch of different uh, uh, geometric tolerance symbols that you might see for cylindricity, circularity, flatness, angularity, parallelism, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's the way that you show it. You always have a reference, and then your surface will be referred to it with the tolerance zone. Now, how do we show that in uh, SOLIDWORKS? So let me show you an example here. So in this example, let's say I want this surface to be perpendicular to the bottom surface with some tolerance zone. So what I do under annotation, first I click here on the datum feature, and then I provide it on that edge and say I would call this reference A. You can have more than one reference if you want in a drawing. And then you click on geometric tolerance, but before that, first click on this edge and then click on geometric tolerance and here. What do you want? You want it to be perpendicular to primary plane A with a tolerance zone of 0.02. And there we go. Here. right or let's say the angle between this plane and a should ideally be what what is this angle this is 45 degrees right so you show the 45 degree like this and then you say well I want that surface to be at angle with plane A with a gap not bigger than 0.02. Okay, and that's another one. So this is how you define parallel uh, perpendicular, or you can, for example, again, say the top one should be parallel to the bottom one, right? So you say they should be parallel, tolerance zone of 0.03 with respect to A, and there we go. Right? So these are different uh, geometric tolerances that I have shown for you here. The last thing that we want to discuss here is called surface finish. And what is that? So when you create parts, when you manufacture parts, although they might be quite polished and they look very... Uh, flat, very nice, and you don't, maybe with naked eyes, cannot easily see a lot of ups and downs on the surface, but no roughness, basically. But if you, even if they are really polished, if you put them under a device that can help you magnify them, a magnifier, a microscope, anything, you would see a lot of roughnesses. And depending on the manufacturing method, some of the methods are too rough that you can easily, they are so visible that you can easily see them without any help of any device. So now how far is this roughness acceptable? Can I make any surface, any rough that I want? Should I make every surface super nice polished like mirror? Because you know, the 
more polished and the less rough we make a surface, it means more time and more cost. So when is it that um, it is good or it is not good? How do we determine that for the manufacturer? Or actually in here is the opposite. Um, uh, we tell the manufacturer what manufacturing method to use. So let me tell you. So before I do that, I want to tell you about a few terminologies and then I will tell you how to define this for a manufacturer and what does it mean to the manufacturer. So some terminologies. In an ideal case, if you can show the ups and downs, the roughness of the surface, like here, then if you look at the base, the very bottom of the surface, okay, the deviation, the vertical deviation of any point with respect to base is what we call the roughness height. Then we have roughness width, which is the distance between one peak point to the next peak point. Then uh, depending on the manufacturing, we can have different lay direction and lay is the direction of these uh, ridges, okay? The picks, if you connect the picks together, in which direction these ridges or these picks are connected? Are they perpendicular to some edge? Are they parallel to some edge? Are they circular? For example, in a lathe machine, because of the nature of the machine, typically if you look at these lathes, they are concentric circles. So then if there is a wave, so these roughness heights are increasing, then decreasing, then increasing, then decreasing, like a sine wave then we can define also a waviness width, which is kind of like a wavelength, and then a waviness height, which is kind of like an amplitude in vibrations, right? So we can define all of them. The most important thing that the manufacturer need to know is the roughness height and the lay direction. Now, uh, the thing is, well, so, uh, how do we determine this, uh, what, how, what number do we provide for the manufacturer? Because if you look at these roughness heights, they are not all the same. So which one of these numbers do we give to the manufacturer, right? We say, hey, the maximum of the roughness height should be, uh, 0.002 units or the min of them should be that or the average of them should be so what number when we provide a symbol like this by the way whenever you see the symbol which is like a check mark ideally it's not exactly like a check mark there is also a horizontal line so it looks kind of like a square root symbol so whenever you see that symbol that is the surface finish so when I say 63 here for that top surface, what do I mean? First of all, 63 what? 63 looks like a huge number. Yes, so whenever we provide this number for surface finish, it is always in micro. So this is 63 micro inches. Okay, so that's the meaning of the number on the top of the symbol or the square root. The average, so uh, as I said, 63 is 63 micro inches, and this 63 is the average, the arithmetic average of all of these uh, roughness heights, okay? Because they are all different, so we say the average of them should be around 63 micro inches. And also the lay, as I said, that's the direction of the ridges with respect to the part, which could be parallel to an edge, perpendicular to an edge. It could be in a kind of cross direction, both directions. It could be in a variety of directions. When we see M, C means they are concentric, R means they are radial, and P means kind of uh, in no specific direction. Okay, so that's the meaning of different lay directions. Now, 
where do we put the numbers that we defined here? So the way that we put them, the main number, as I said, which is the arithmetic average of the roughness heights will go here and the top left corner of the roughness symbol. Then under the roughness symbol, you have the symbol for the leg direction. Next to that is the roughness width. And then above this horizontal line, if we provide these numbers, that's going to be waviness height separated by a dash with from waviness width. Typically in uh, drawings, you barely see waviness height, waviness width, or roughness width. As I said, the one that is really determining the manufacturing method is the average of the surface roughness heights, this number and the lay. So now what's the meaning of uh, this uh, surface roughness to the manufacturer? So here is a table and this table contains the average uh, roughness for any surface that is created by one of these manufacturing methods on the left column. So it says, for example, if you create a surface using flame cutting, of course we know that flame cutting is really not a way to prepare surfaces, it's actually just to cut apart. But of course the surface quality of a part that is manufactured by flame cutting should be not so nice. So here you see a band in front of flame cutting. And this band has two parts, light blue and dark blue. So light blue is for a general person that can do flame cutting, like a rookie person, a general person, anybody that basically takes a torch and tries to cut something. But uh, the blue band is for somebody that is professional and consistent. So if you are a pro and consistent, then the average roughness uh, height that you can obtain using flame cutting is anywhere between what? 500 to 1000 micro inches. Or in micromillimeters, it's anywhere between 12.5 to 25 mic uh, millimeters, okay? So, uh, micro, micrometers, I'm sorry, micrometers, or a thousands of a millimeter. So, uh, if you want to take the midpoint of the band, so if you do flame cutting, and if you're a pro, or maybe even if you're a rookie, you expect something around, what, 750 micro inches, which is a big roughness, easily visible with naked eyes, okay? But now, if you come and say to the manufacturer, hey, I need a, an average surface roughness of what? That number that we had over here, 63, right? So if I say 63 micro inches is all I can tolerate, then uh, it means the manufacturing method for the final surface polishing or final surface creation that the person can choose should have an average band right below the 63. So clearly all of the methods to the left are creating much rougher surface. So I should take this 63 and go down and find a method the average of which is around 63 and I can see broaching and I can see reaming well, of course, not every uh, surface can be reamed or broached, right? So we know reaming we use for holes after drilling to make it more cylindrical. So uh, depending on the thing, or maybe the ones that can surpass it like this one, right? Using electrochemicals to make the surface really polished or what? Electrolytic grinding or roller burnishing, right? Typically, when you go down from the top to the bottom, except for these guys here, because the surface finish is much better, of course, it means the uh, electro-polishing method is significantly more costly than, of course, flame cutting or sawing, right? 
So uh, it tells the manufacturer what method to use to create the final surface finish. And uh, so that's the meaning. And this is how you can show that in SOLIDWORKS. But uh, before we finish this lecture, by the way, there is some extra material for you for welding. I'm not going to get into that because welding is a really big topic by itself. And if I want to get into welding, then you need some uh, significant background on welding so that I explain to you. I can, uh, if you want, you can see how the welding symbol is shown in SOLIDWORKS. But uh, again, you have to understand it. And understanding it is uh, typically something that is taught in a machine design course or so. So uh, I'm not going to do it for this course, but I just provided some symbols, examples, and how, and I'll show you where to access that in SOLIDWORKS, but I'm not going to get into much detail of that because it's going to be too brief and too shallow. So uh, just putting that for further studies. Now, I said that we can create surface finish, right, in SOLIDWORKS, and I show you. But uh, why is this surface finish at all important? Why do we need... For some parts, some maybe average surface roughness of 60 micro inches, while for others 500. Where is it that surface finish is so important? And one example could be probably where? Yes, in a milling machine, in lathe machine, where you have one part moving on the other, right? When one part moves inside the guide, and uh, if the surfaces are not really well polished, you're going to have a lot of friction and a lot of wear and tear, right? Where else? So one of the places is uh, the valves in an engine. Let me show you. So valves in engine. If you look at the valves in engine, so these are valves, okay? And these are the things that will make the mixture of air and fuel to get into the engine then they close it then when the explosion happens and it is burned this other exhaust valve opens and let the burn mixture get out to the exhaust of the car okay so there are two or four or five valves in each cylinder that you have piston cylinder combination and they look like this now this top surface of this valve that sits against the engine block, it has to be really polished and the rest of it too. Because if the surface is not well polished as well as the sitting area in the engine block that this guy sits on, if those surfaces are not well polished, then when they are sitting on each other, there are what? Because of these roughnesses, there will be some uh, like cavities or some uh, outlets between them, right? Imagine you have this surface for the valve top surface and you have something similar to this for what? For the uh, engine body, right? And you put them on the top of each other like this. Well, what do you expect? Of course, because of all these roughnesses, they are not going to be perfectly sitting on each other and with all the pressure that the burn mixture of fuel and air has it can easily escape it okay because the working pressure inside the engine is so high so for working conditions in engine for anywhere that i need to keep pressure and seal it i really need very well polished surfaces okay so just for your information now uh, let me show you how to do that in SOLIDWORKS. So in SOLIDWORKS, if you want, let's say I want some surface finish on this uh, specific top surface. So I click on surface finish. I click on this uh, edge. And uh, here, you see that symbol is added. If you want, you can click on it and then you can provide the numbers. So here is gonna be the average roughness height in micro inches so let's say i want 32 micro inches and then here you have the symbol for it so let's say i want it with the lathe machine or with the uh, 
uh, milling machine so I just want it to be perpendicular to the edge and again as I said I can provide waviness height and width here and I can provide the um, uh, roughness width here too but typically they are not used so there we go now I say this is 32 micro inches average roughness height and the lay direction should be perpendicular to this edge okay so this is how you do it by the way i told you i'm going to show you how to access weld symbol that's where you access the weld symbol and you can put the weld symbol between the two surfaces that need to be welded together but again we're not going to go over that and one last thing is please 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 by no means put do not put any of these numbers any of these dimensions tolerances surface finish any of them never put them on the isometric view this isometric view as i said is just a redundant not redundant it's just an extra view just for visualization so i have seen my students in the past who came and did something like this okay and then they put the information on it and then they try to do it or they did datum like on this one uh, not datum target, datum feature, they put it here, and then stuff like that. So please do not do that. Nothing should go on the isometric, nothing. Unless it is an assembly, and that is the isometric of the assembly, either the assembly or exploded assembly, and you just show the balloons on the parts. That's the only thing that goes on an assembly uh, isometric view. Okay? So... I think I have covered the drawing that we need for this course, so I'll see you in the next lecture.